Well, this morning we have a rather <coughs> interesting and uh, somewhat lurid story out of the mythology of the Greeks. Now, of course, in mythology, everything happened once upon a time. The particular dates are not generally given. But once upon a time, the gods on high Olympus had the desire to create something beside the membership of their own group. So they got together and they took clay and they molded it into the form of a beautiful woman. And having made a perfect statue, the gods decided to give it life. So they made it living. And each gave something to it. Athena gave it wisdom and understanding and insight and sympathy. And one of the other deities gave it courage. Another one gave it longevity. And many of the goddesses got together and made beautiful robes and garments and flowered turbans for this new wonderful creature. And when they all were finished, there was Pandora. Now, Pandora is an interesting symbol, and most interpreters have failed to get the large meaning of it. As you hear the story, it becomes evident that Pandora is a personifying symbol of the planet Earth itself. It began, or basically, is clay. It is molded into the detours and forms and lines and styles that we see today. All the wisdom of the ages have conferred beauty upon the earth, wisdom and courage and understanding and laws, until it is truly a gorgeous planet. And this was what the gods had intended and which they accomplished so magnificently. Now at this time, Zeus was having troubles. His greatest trouble was with Prometheus, a titan who was uh, not only brave and strong but audacious. And this titan had dared to take the fire of heaven and against the will of Zeus give it to mortality upon the earth. Now uh, Prometheus had a brother, also a bit of a radical and perhaps even an activist, who was concerned largely and deeply with the advancement of the work of fire upon the earth and upon the development of arts and crafts and sciences. Zeus was, was willing that, that uh, Pandora should marry this brave and heroic titan. So they were married in due course by the gods with great ceremonial. And as a wedding present, Zeus bestowed upon Pandora a box. Now, just what uh, this box was is a little dim from mythology because the accounts differ. Some say it was like a shape of a cube about the shape of the earth. Others said it was a vase or urn with a lid. Some believed that it was some kind of a casket. But anyway, he gave it with the admonition that under no condition should it be opened. Now at this point, the story would sound rather familiar and nine people out of ten would guess who opened the box. But they were wrong. Pandora did not open the box. It was her husband. <laughs> and in that moment, he allowed all the ills and evils of mankind to come out of that box. And before he could get the lid down, everything was gone except hope, which was clinging desperately to the inside of the box. <laughs> so here we have a problem that is very interesting. Here we have nature, the earth, beautiful, and wonderful, and united in marriage to the ambitions of the human mind. And that was the beginning of the big trouble. It was the big trouble because no sooner had the husband become aware of the facts of life and had seen the disasters flowing out of the box, he was impelled to do something about it. And nearly everything everyone has done about it since the beginning has been a mistake. It has only made things worse. Now every development, every invention, every art and science has its box. 
it has its Pandora lid down and somebody lifts it. Then the trouble starts. And the trouble gradually forms to prove conclusively that practically every achievement of man is in violation with the laws of nature. The struggle between man and nature begins in the story of Pandora's box. Now in this particular case, we find that man attempting to advance his own destiny in the natural world begins from the beginning to do his will and not the will of nature. He does not follow the loving uh, pattern of his wife, Pandora, but of his brother, Prometheus, who is bound to create a world that pleases him. Now, in the process of pleasing himself, he gets creation into difficulties. Now, nearly everything that we know today began with nature. We have a planet that is capable of sustaining a large number of human beings. Also, many other forms of life, and like a ship, is floating through space in its orbit. The Earth is capable of a great deal of advancement and perfection, but it is also capable of a great many disorders, because nature comes to to tell us that there are laws that must be followed. And man says, these laws of nature do not agree with our ambitions. We do not want to live according to nature. We want to shape nature according to ourselves. We wish to become the rulers of this little planet. We are going to be the strong, bold, babe husband of Pandora. We are going to run this world as we believe it should be run, and we are going to keep right on doing this. Now, somewhere in the beginning of time also, it was now obvious that most creatures and and human beings had very little knowledge of natural law. They only had experience to prove to them what was best and what was not best. As time went on, however, science and philosophy and religion, the arts and all these things, increased our knowledge of nature. They showed us a great deal about the world in which we live. They showed us many of the laws of this world, and they also pointed out the disasters which result from breaking these laws. But not never heeding or minding, man's mind went on doing as it pleased, with no consideration for the natural values of life. With the uh, ambitious individual forgot that this little earth on which we live It's like an alchemical bottle, and it's been used as a symbol in alchemy. But in this little earth, there are limited amounts of many things, but they are limited amounts. This earth is a kind of vessel, perhaps the Pandora's box, which if we use it, will release to us all kinds of potentials, will help us to grow in a thousand ways. But if abused and perverted, this same earth can turn upon us as a very sad and angered victim of our intemperances. So man started out to change the earth. He knew what he was doing in a sense, but he had forgotten that his own will was not paramount. Behind the will of man is the will of nature, and behind the will of nature is the mind of God. Therefore, the human being, when he goes against nature, violates not only natural but divine law. And nature punishes him for his violation of natural law, and divinity punishes him for the violation of divine law. Now, we are beginning to realize this much more than it was realized long ago in the age of fable. We are beginning to see the use and abuse and misuse of the normal available resources of life. The earth is like a bottle. It can be filled. It was full when we took it over. But it is not a self-filling bottle. It is not a magic pitcher. As we exhaust the natural resources of the earth, there is no way of restoring them. Therefore, the first thing that we should be considering always 
is to conserve these resources so that they can endure indefinitely until such time as the natural span of life as we know it and was ordained in heaven is fulfilled. Instead of that, we are wasting these resources every single day. We are already in serious difficulties. Supposing we consider another bottle that is important in this single, the human body. The human body has assets and liabilities which we have to remember and consider. We could not bleed blood out of this body every day for years and the body remain alive. Yet we take a mysterious substance called petroleum out of the earth and we do not care how much of it we use, we actually try to force the sale of it. We try to make more of everything in order that we can squander, swap, borrow, steal, and exchange. There is no sense of actual conservation behind this program. It gradually changes from something founded in nature and essentially good to something that has been reworked over by man and now is essentially dangerous. We'll start with some little simple thing like Ford's Fliver, which was quite a nice innovation into the transportation. We all gave thanks to our inventor and to ourselves that we were privileged to have this convenience. We were morally glad because it saved a great many horses from the miseries and tortures of cruel drivers and uh, herdsmen. But gradually something happened. Until today, we, are, we might say, in a seven-day deluge of automobiles. Instead of having the cars we need, instead of conserving, instead of building cars economical in gas and long-lasting in mechanical, mechanical structure, we are going into a vast area of exploitation. We are trying desperately to sell more cars, and to do this we have to build more highways. We already have eight-lane roads, now not enough. And gradually, unless we are careful, we are going to be choked to death with our own cars. Now, it all started as a beautiful idea, but nobody kept the rules. The rules were that you do everything as economically, carefully, and moderately as possible. And we have done exactly the reverse. We have taken what could have been a very nice, moderate thing to help us to get around, and changed it into a vast empire of profits, with built-in decline and decay, and an annual output that will keep on until there is not room on the planet Earth to take care of them. So this is how, one by one, we have turned the natural skills of man into the bad news that comes out of Pandora's bottle. Every one of the inclemencies, sorrows, and miseries that were in that bottle or box uh, represented an original good idea ruined by human selfishness, corrupted by avarice and overworked by ambitions. We were never willing to live with nature as a friend. We've never been able to live together with nature without trying to dominate, confuse, buy, sell, barter, or exchange something that never belonged to us. So we have this type of thing coming every day. And the, the news is becoming interesting to a great many people. We are more thoughtful than we ever were before in matters concerning such things as this. And after we got the automobiles carefully built, and now have millions of them coming off the various creating companies every year, we turn to another thing that came along. Well, about this time, somebody invented an airplane. They had some gas balloons earlier. The Gamofia brothers built one, which was used in the French Revolution and in the later wars. But we are now creating these planes by the thousand. They are also becoming no longer useful to us. They are becoming vast industry in themselves. They are also now helping us to exterminate each other, exterminate each other in warfare. And we are also decimating the population by the failure of many of these planes to function normally. 
we now have a tremendous industry which has been largely turned into military strength out of something that was originally a very nice little way of sailing from here to the next town. No thought of nature, no thought of what we are doing, no thought of overbuilding, no thought of extravagance, no attention paid to the tremendous price of now creating an aeroplane, everything going part of a great economic industrial system in dead contrast to the natural laws under which we live. So we got that out of the way, finally, or rather we don't, didn't get it out of the way, but other things came surfaced and it retired into a continuous cause of problem. And along came another recent discovery, the motion picture. Now, anyone who can remember back to the first film of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius will realize that in the beginning it was a very simple educational situation. The films ran at from five to six minutes. There was no wheel to wind them up on. They unwound into a basket and were rewound by hand. These pr primitive films uh, were at the Nickelodeon where you paid five cents to watch something juggle about for a few minutes. All this has gradually changed. Now we are dealing with a vast economic empire with millions of people overpaid with the production values almost exterminated, with everything that might have come out of this great discovery that would advance civilization, sacrificed for profit. So we're paying more and more and getting less and less, and so finally we will find that the productions as we know them now are a little better than psychotic. So here was a good idea. Nature was not against the motion picture, but it was against any abuse of any subject at any time and penalizes it. And so gradually, inevitably, this uh, interesting little device is turning into a disaster, a tremendous cause of misery, one of the sorrows and forms of sad sadness that came out of Pandora's box. And we hardly got that out of the way before something else came along to give us a cheer. And now... Uh, we have atomic and nuclear fission. Now, this was possibly inspired a little, perhaps, in the hope of being able uh, to find a more convenient way of uh, motorizing uh, our vehicles or industrial plants. But what we have come out with, finally, is a very dangerous and very deadly possibility for self-destruction, either intentional or accidental. A great mystery surrounds the whole subject, and we are still suffering from the causes that we have set in motion. Our petroleum industry is in the same condition. It was started by a few little lamps that were harmless and managed to light the neighborhood for a while. It has now become a multi-billion dollar monopoly in which it is being used for every purpose except that which nature intended. So nature doesn't like these things, and it has ways of pointing out that it is unhappy and uh, is not pleased. So we go on from one thing to another, and the last contribution to all of this is the computer. Now we have a new ailment, an ailment which we don't know very much about, but is developing with leaps and bounds and is certainly being overused, misused, and abused. It is gradually supposed to save us all hard work. It is supposed to take the place of a large part of education, which in turn means a very great diminishment of discipline in the mind. It gradually is going to turn our mental lives into the, become the manipulators of thinking devices to take the place of our own thinking. All of this is considered just wonderful. We're just going to pretty soon have nothing to do, and when we have nothing to do, we will not be paid anything to do it. This type of problem is there. But most of all, as far as nature is concerned, is the waste that is involved. We are living on the surface of a bottle. There is only so much in the bottle of anything, so much gold, silver, oil, oil, concrete, all these things. The surface of the earth 
is a, is a gravel or sand or rock. We have now risen above the surface of the earth all over the world with great cities that are built entirely off the surface of the earth and are strengthened and built by the exhaustion of natural resources. We are building and building until there will be a square foot of land left for the individual to use for any purpose except business. All of this is not pleasing to nature. It is not what was intended because it is a slow but inevitable form of suicide. We have no indication or proof that when these supplies are exhausted that they will be refinished or will be uh, replaced. We have no proof of our hope that sometime we can mine into the fields of space and find an answer there. The proof of the pudding is we will not find answers for problems that we should never have created. If we were in legitimate tragedy as a result of factors beyond our consideration or knowledge, things could be done about it. But the present world in its present condition is definitely and definitely an achievement of our own. We have created it, we are trying to live in it, and we are finding it unlivable. Now this is part of this plan that Zeus has. He warned the world when Prometheus discovered fire that this fire would not be used forever just to warm the cold feet of primitive people. This fire was going to be used for incendiary purpose. And the Chinese fireworks that were used for weddings and funerals were changed into our aerial bombs to torpedo the earth. So we, we have gradually abused things. And now comes the possibility of reckoning. Now, no one wants to look forward to the probabilities of an extermination of our planet. And there's no need to. But there is need for us to begin to recognize the need for conservation of resources. There is need for us to think a little beyond ourselves. Now, not too long ago, people were not very much interested in that thought because they felt that whatever was going to go wrong would go wrong after they had left here, and that it would fall upon their descendants under the third and fourth generation. We're not so sure of that now, because it looks as though some of the pain is starting already, and therefore that we cannot continue to put off corrections and continue to cultivate the vices. So here we have a, a new world order coming about, we have more and more people conscious of the needs. We have greater and greater emphasis upon the development of characters that are strong, constructive, and right. Facing another election this year, we are becoming more and more cautious on the problem, somewhat disillusioned, certainly suspicious, and more and more inclined to be as thoughtful as conditions permit. We are beginning to realize that we have to change our own ways. Now this goes right back into another one of Pandora's boxes, and that is the world home. The home is a box, it's an institution. It was created to provide security for coming races so that they could develop into maturity with intelligent backgrounds of care and thought and dedication. These now, these, these motives now require a certain amount of unselfishness, and there are fewer and fewer unselfish people. They want perfect freedom, they want to do as they please, and as a result of that, old natural law is in more and more trouble. Now, natural law cannot react in just a volcanic equation, or maybe in an earthquake, although they can come too. But natural law comes in the increasing of tragedy. Natural law is the result of narcotics. Natural law shows that these things cannot be done with impunity. Man makes rules, nature makes laws. We are under the rulership and the laws of a power greater than ourselves, and we will never be able to compromise or modify that power. We can ignore it, we can misinterpret it, we can claim that it means something else, but the fact of the matter is law, as far as the universe is concerned, is unchangeable. Law punishes vice and rewards virtue, and in terms 
that viceful which is destructive and that virtuous which is constructive. So we are now coming to a sort of parting of the ways. We are coming to the time when a new way of life is getting closer and closer. A way of life that is based upon cooperation for the common good instead of competition for private profit. We are beginning to see that we are approaching a dead end of selfishness, that it cannot continue without ultimately destroying the planet. So we must now find ways of re-educating ourselves. And it might be a good idea somewhere along the line for the public school system to take a greater interest in the study of natural law, the rules of the game of life, because it is perfectly possible to find out what is not right, even though we may not be completely sure of that which is right. We can prove up to a certain point that the mistakes that we make are always followed by the same unfortunate consequences. We can discipline young people gradually, maybe, into the realization that perversity does not pay, and that suffering is inevitable, where the individual goes contrary to the pattern to which he belongs. We look out at the stars at night, we look into the heavens, and we see the galaxies, all covered and controlled by law. And the fact that the human being is a little insignificant detail somewhere does not prevent him from being under that same law. The law that creates the galaxy is also responsible for the growth and development of the human being. He is a comparatively small microcosm, but he is a miniature of the greater world. And the rules that apply to one apply to both. Everywhere we turn, there is a great need for recognizing that there is no way of patching up mistakes. The character of the individual must be taught so that these mistakes are no longer made. You can never remedy a situation completely once it has gotten out of hand and has disintegrated in misery for all concerned. Now, to get hold of these natural laws, we must go beyond the stock exchange. We must get into an entirely different field of life. We must study carefully and thoughtfully the biologies of nature. We must realize what happens when things happen that we do and what we cause. We must realize what is going to happen when we keep on contaminating water. Our water supply is in danger. We are also in a condition where our atmosphere is in danger. Instead of trying to find ways to change that, we are trying to change laws to permit it to continue. We object strenuously to controlling the various ailments and misfortunes which we are causing. Therefore, we have to get back down to the mere fact, real fact, that man was not created for the purpose of being an economic giant. He was not in, uh, embodied into this flesh so that he could continue to fight with his neighbor until the end of time. He was not created for the purpose of building a home and then walking out on it. He was not built in any of these cases, nor was he built with the intention of developing physical habits which would destroy him. The individual can never win in a battle against natural law. He might as well begin to examine it now and see how to, he can save himself. He cannot create a remedy for a mistake, except by changing the mistake. He cannot get a pill that will cure him of his indiscretions unless he changes his own nature. And the world is now paying millions and billions of dollars for panaceas, economic, social, and biological, to, to correct or help us to survive our own mistakes. This won't happen. We will keep on making the mistakes. Those who create panaceas will be richly rewarded while they are selling a mistake, and the, er and the errors will go on as before. So education now calls for a complete re renovation of who is who in the universe. The actual thing that we have to know is that we are living under an immutable system of laws. These laws are completely benevolent. These laws are impartial, impersonal. They are created for the purpose of advancing the common good, to perpetuate life where it belongs, 
to maintain the balance of nature in every field. As we gradually cover every square foot of earth until there is no earth visible anymore, lose all our farmlands, as we continue to fill our air with smog and all these things, we keep right on with the assumption that the great reason that we are here is to build industries that will pay us billions of dollars and then go around sneezing our heads off with the smog or paying an elaborate doctor's bill to find a panacea for it, which can never be done, by the way. So we are now in this position where common sense must come back into authority. All, all else has been tried. We have done everything we can conceive of to avoid facts. We, want, we disagree with facts because they disagree with ambitions. We all want to be successful, but we do not realize that unless our success is founded in natural law, it will only end in suicide. Actually, then, we have a great new science coming. It is not now the tablets of the law revealed to Moses from the crest of Sinai. It is now the infinite plan of things as written in every grain of sand. A, a, the plan that is revealed in every act of living things, in the balance of nature, in the magnificent coordination of the working parts of natural existence. We must gradually come face to face with the fact that we must maintain this balance, that we must prevent excess. And whether this is excess of poverty or excess of wealth, it is equally punishable. So everywhere... The science of finding out what nature wants should be the supreme quest of human nature and human beings. We've gotten to realize that the Pandora's box cannot be closed again. But the only thing that remains for us in that box that may be useful is hope. And hope is the ability to dream of things to be done. Hope, faith, and love are the great redeeming powers at this time and then not one of the three is involved in profit. It is involved rather in character and the restoration of right. The end of all kinds of political diligences and indiligences that cause the common problems we face today. The question isn't whether it is a politically useful or not. The question is, is it naturally inevitable? We must get back to nature we forget that we are the same type of life as all other living things on this planet. We share a certain universality with the tree and the bird, and while we are not trees and not birds, we have the same rules, and these rules must be kept. Each animal has its territory, and it doesn't try to take over somebody else's. Each one of us has certain responsibilities, which we have to carry. And while we evade and avoid these responsibilities and try to create a fun generation, we will end where almost all of this type of fun does end, in misery. Now, the, the, I would like to think in terms of the possibility of their gradually developing a new science, a science of building upon natural law in all things, not merely in the scientific laboratory, but in morality and in ethics. We have faced the physical universe through science and have learned a great deal, but have not you learned yet enough to take care of ourselves. But as far as our moral and ethical lives are concerned, we have not made a solid, basic science out of doing it right. We have still allowed all of our industries and our activities to be motivated by physical profit rather than by obedience to natural law. We are all under nature. We can't get away from it. There's no use hoping that each of us or any of us can be exceptions to this rule. In some mysterious way, the truth is born in each of us. And when we forget that truth, we begin to die. Until that truth is available to the people of the world, until we realize that this earth is capable of sustaining probably three times its present population if the idea of profit is modified. We are able to conserve resources. We do not have to have everything we want. 
because if we do, we are going to come very soon to the point where no one will have what they need. We do not have to have the expansion of wealth. We do not need the garage with five cars in it, because we have no road to put them on, and we are impoverishing the earth for the materials to build them. We are no longer in a position to waste. We also have to find proper uses for our nuclear waste, for all our other problems. We cannot continue to contaminate the oceans. We cannot continue to decimate the living things upon the earth, because each one has a part to play in the survival of all the rest. A cooperation has to rise out of competition. Now it will come. Hope will not, is not only in the bottom of the box, but it is also in the bottom of the human heart. We all hope. We all also have reasons to believe that hope is a form of enlightenment. To hope is to come once more into the family of the God-led. To hope is to recognize the inevitable salvation of that which is right. We know these things inside ourselves. Now we've got to begin to live them. We are going to have to do those things which will enable this planet to continue for a long time. And if we do it right, and if we behave ourselves, there are possibilities that we will have special dispensations as we find them in nature. That nature does not destroy anything for the pleasure of destroying it. Nature does not wreck anything that is right but it will not preserve or maintain things that are essentially wrong. So we can begin in little ways to cultivate a realization of nature and its laws. We can sit down and read a little about it to start off, maybe, just to give ourselves a foundation. <clears throat> we can read something about astronomy. We can also learn from astronomy the dangers we face there, the contamination of the Earth's atmosphere, and the fact that the energy problems uh, of these base envelopes, this energy problem is in danger. There is a definite an indication that we are polluting the air faster than nature can cleanse it. This doesn't seem to affect anybody. The same old smokestacks are still belching forth. The same somewhat unreliable motors are continuing to service uh, the smog bank with more and more of that type of thing. Also other fumes, chemical and otherwise, and the congestions of cities, slowly the atmosphere is getting sick. Now this isn't going to be any good for anybody, and no matter how many dollars we have, we're not going to get far if the atmosphere fails us. So we have to begin to think about conserving in person. Now, there are probably about several billion human beings, and of these, you, there is a considerable number that can be made aware of its moral responsibilities, but nobody makes much of it. No one really goes out after it. The uh, theologian talks about the laws of God, but doesn't have much to say about the laws of nature, which God established. We find this politician has no interest in the laws of nature, he is tied largely to his political commitments. The economist has no interest in the laws of nature. He has only interest in profit and loss. And each, in, in his own field in education, it is largely the same. The average physician does not know much about the laws of nature. He knows only the effects of drugs upon ailments. And is largely learning nowadays that the drugs don't work. We have the same in the arts. We no longer portray the beautiful because we don't know it when we see it. And the prize now goes to some incongruous thing which no one understands, including the artist who did it. <laughs> we are not learning the beauties of things. Our music is contaminated. And we know this contamination is dangerous psychologically. Don't pay any attention to it. Why? Because we don't care. And then somewhere along the line a desperate illness hits us and then we say the bottom is out of the universe. But everywhere there is an indifference to values, an indifference to integrities. There is no concern over the problems such as narcotics, 
Sure there is concern, but the problem should be solved by the common sense of humanity rather than making necessary all kinds of laws and all kinds of rules and arresting the peddlers. The, the person who understands even the basic principles of life will not be contaminated. But nobody gets at the basic facts. No one is able to reach behind the uh, more or less routine preachments that do not have a great effect. We've got to get back to the fact that each of us as an individual is part of a creation and is a miniature of that creation. And each of, this cre of these creations is part of a larger uh, development in the face of nature. And finally, the planet itself is a vast microcosm, a vast instrument with rules and laws. It gives life to those who obey and it takes life from those who disobey. No, it doesn't take life in the sense of destroying it, because nature's laws are physical, and therefore all nature has rulership over is the physical. But the physical in turn, our physical body, for example, we know has its own rules. These rules may not be the same as those of our minds or our emotions, but we do find usually that if the mind helps the body, we are better off. And if the emotions support the findings of science, we are still a little better off. In other words, while our supernatural or superphysical bodies are not part of the physical world, it is true that our invisible spiritual natures do affect the security of these physical bodies and help to assure that they will continue as long as possible. Therefore, it is up to the individual to go to work to, co to correct the emotional and mental problems of his own inner life. His entire nature is within a bottle. This bottle is his magnetic field, and within this magnetic field he lives and moves and has his being. And into this magnetic field he tosses all the refuse of his life. Into the magnetic field go his hates, his angers, his fears, his, his uh, cynicisms. Into this goes his indulgences, his poisonings, and his evil acts and thoughts. He co destroys or corrupts his own source of immediate vitality by the perversion of his own conduct. Nature has something to do with this. Nature's laws are that the body of things will be better if the part that is in the body is also obedient. <coughs> Now, the emotions are not necessarily obedient to the laws of the physical world, but they are obedient to the laws of integrities, to honesties, to constructive and creative uses. The mind and the emotions must be used and not abused, or they contribute to the destruction of the whole structure. You cannot have a healthy body if the mind is sick. You cannot have a healthy mind if the emotions are sick. Health is a kind of completeness. In this case, the human being is the bottle, is the earth, is the substance, and the physical rules are there in natural law. As we follow the natural laws, we protect health of the body. We get over dissipations. We get over overindulgences. Then within the body is the emotional life, which we also have in the planet. The planet has its emotions. These emotions are the fears of nations. They are the sorrows of abused peoples. They are the evidences of corrupt administrations. And this pain affects the entire fabric from which each individual must gather the elements of his own emotions. As we must keep the physical body nourished by the foods that grow in the ground or fly on trees, so the emotional life of the individual must be nourished from the emotional resources of the planet. And these emotional resources are being adulterated and perverted until hate and fear are about the only thing we have in abundance. We have to change all this. We have to nourish the emotional life of the planet. We have to be kind. We have to use things in a way that will help us to restore the original garden to which we were given in the first place which we were supposed to take care of it. 
We were supposed to be gardeners in the garden of the Lord. Instead of that, we are filching the plants, just allowing the weeds to take over and spending our time somewhere else, wasting time. All these things have got to change. The mind has to change. And a good mind and good emotions in a physical body that is well organized may or may not extend physical life depending on circumstances that cannot be fully estimated, but will make the eternal life, eternal life of that person, here, elsewhere, or in other embodiments, that much further ahead. And the more we grow now, the more growth we will have with which to face the future. And if we can grow a little now, there will come into our world in due time persons with greater vision, greater intelligence, greater integrities to help us to face these problems with which we must all someday be faced. So we have one world under one rule. And there is no way of escaping this. There's no possible way of the individual succeeding in wrongdoing. For the moment he may get away with his lie, but in the end the lie will do away with him. For the moment he may make great profits, but uh, a few little bacteria somewhere in the system can end the profit system for him. We may hope that we can conquer nations, but none of us can ever own anything except the very body that we have and that is perishable. Everywhere we are building on a false foundation. We are believing that great cities have strength in them. We are proud of population increase. We are afraid of the birth rate, but more afraid of the death rate. Everything is in excess. We wonder how we're going to take care of the millions of people here. We can take care of three times what we have if we are not completely selfish thinking only of extreme profit for ourselves and letting the rest do the best they can. Nature will control this problem. Some years ago, there was a series of experiments made on one of the mesas in America's Southwest. In this particular mesa, there was a flat plateau on the top, and the precipitous sides were such that no living creature other than a bird could possibly get to the top of that mesa. Everyone, everything that had to climb or crawl had to stay below. Also, there was very little chance in that desert region for any form of plant life to make the ascent because it was pretty much above anywhere it, the, it could go and also the barren surface was not hospitable to keep plants alive. A team went up there and examined the situation and found a miniature society there of living things. They found that they had that mesa, a little isolated area of a few acres on the top of precipitous cliffs, had its own flora and fauna, that, they, that uh, for centuries certain creatures had continued to thrive there by cooperation. Everything there was saved from contamination by outside selfishness, there was no hunter to shoot the animals. There was no man to fish the stream. There was no smog to destroy living creatures or blight the foliage. And there, for thousands of years, a miniature economy had been a success. And will be a success until the individual here, human being, figures a way to subdivide it for condominiums. <laughs> then it will be gone. But nature will give us what we need if we use it wisely. It will give us the means to survive almost any challenge that can possibly come to us, but it will not aid and abet foolishness or stupidity. Now we're working towards world peace and we hope we're going to find it. But if we don't find it, or even if we do find it, let us remember that war has never yet been able to accomplish one good thing because it is contrary to nature. Now, wars have accomplished reforms, but if there had been no war and nature had been obeyed, the reforms would have been unnecessary because the vices would not have existed. So there are two ways of getting rid of a vice. One is to shoot and the other is to change it into something constructive and useful to all concerned. I think we should also recognize 
that as we go far now into another century, uh, with an increase of everything in the form of responsibility, that we should personally make a careful study of our own ad- adequate uh, applications of principles. What do we need? What do we want most? What are we willing to sacrifice for what we do need? What is there that we can do to advance our own destiny but at the same time not detract from the destiny of anything else? What can we do to grow without living as parasites off of something else? We have rules on all these things. There are natural laws. The great scriptures and philosophies of the world have given us good working rules, but we have to obey them. And against these are indifference, selfishness, and ambition. We are not much interested in keeping the rules. We want a house in the the summertime and another one in the winter. We want new cars periodically. We are willing to pay fabulous sums for athletic events. We do all the things that we can do that we want to do and which gratify appetites that, strangely enough, can never be gratified. The Egyptians... Uh, represented the appetites as a many-headed monster that could never be fully fed. And the same is true of extravagances and of personal ambitions and the desire and willingness to compromise truth for the sake of profit. Each person has to work this out for himself. Well, you may say, if you work this out for yourself, uh, what good does it do to the common group? Well, it will do something, but we have to remember that in this pattern of things, according to our philosophical convictions, we do not depart from here forever and go either to heaven or hell. Most people are just a little too good for hell, but not good enough for heaven. (laughs) Therefore, we're not going there. We're going right back to the next day in school. And if we were at the head of the class when we left here, we will find ourselves at the head of a class when we get there. When we come back, everything that we have gained in personal character helps us to make a contribution to the future, increase our own integrities, and live a better life and become part of a better culture. We have to earn citizenship in a better world. And in order to do that, we've got to help to build a better world while we're here now. Otherwise, we will not accomplish the dreams and hopes and aspirations which are more or less lurking in nearly every human relationship. I think we're becoming more aware also of the very simple rules regarding personal habits. We are beginning to see what happens when people make certain basic common mistakes. And one of the common mistakes today is the failure to give proper consideration to the raising of the young. We are neglecting children dramatically, forcing the responsibility for them upon the state or upon the school, upon something of that kind, while we just neglect them in order to have fun. Now, this is something that is mounting the crime wave to be greatly beyond our expectations. There isn't a day go by in which we don't get notices in the paper, television, or radio of juvenile delinquency. We don't, we shouldn't expect anything else. Why don't we take these notices as proof of something? A few do. There are conscientious parents who do their very best. But most of those who listen to these announcements keep right on doing what they please. Or finding some kind of a 12-year-old babysitter. There is not enough acceptance of the responsibility for mature conduct. We find the crime wave, we read what causes it, and we keep right on causing it, because it doesn't touch us unless somebody steals our car. Then it becomes more or less of a tragedy, and we want more officers on the police department. But the things are not, these are only symptoms. The real failure lies in the individual and the school system and society in general, failing in common sense. Not failing in higher education, which may be merely higher institutionalism, but failing in the honest, simple values of life, summed up perhaps in the famous statement that comes in every nation of the world, practically, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And we, we look around and we see a harvest of weeds, but we don't notice the fact that we sowed them. 
or we blame it on something else. We blame it on our political systems or something, but we are those systems. And today we are faced with the result of our own gradual increasing selfishness. We no longer want to establish a permanent home. It's too much of a burden and a responsibility. Everybody wants to be completely free. But if we're not careful, we may be free in space without a planet under us. We cannot continue this type of thinking. And uh, wisdom has been with us for many, many ages to try to help us in these realizations. There are many great schools of philosophy and ethics that can help us in these things. There is the golden rule, which is a very good one. And there are many other laws and rules. The scriptures of every religion are bound in moral truths that could be used. And of all the earth's population, about two-thirds are nominally affiliated with a religious organization. Religion as a system or a part of knowledge is accepted, but is not necessarily lived. We are not doing what we should do to make sure that we have found certain rules of common sense in our religious teachings. And common sense is simply honesty. And honesty is concern, consideration, a recognition of common responsibility to common good. This we are gradually losing. Now we come to another election year, and we are going to go through another problem which we do not fully understand and which may cause us further anxiety. But this is the opportunity for the individual to do the very best thinking that he can, although it may not be too good. If it is one step ahead of the past, he is making progress. So we have to try to take every emergency that comes along as a means of testing internal strength, and the way in which we can meet this emergency. Can we only sit and wring our hands? Can we learn something? Can we do something? All of us can learn something if we want to. And may that may, what we learn may help us to do something that is better as time goes on. But in all cases and in the future from now on, we are living in a shrinking planet. We are living in a planet tired of the abuses that we have raped upon it. We are gradually exhausting many, many resources. The fun generation is not permanent. It cannot be. Therefore, before we have to economize, why not use better the productions that we have? Why not look around and try to avoid the mistakes that are bringing misery to millions of other people? So we go back to Pandora and her box. And we see in Pandora today a kind of outraged nature. We see a nature that is being torn apart. We see a planet that is being devastated. And we know that this planet was called by the ancients the Great Mother. It is from this planet that we must all gain the substance of survival. The ancients had understood not only the surface of this planet, but its undersurfaces, that which was within it. It know, knew about the magnetic and electric cores within the planet. It knew also that everything in that planet, in this planet, is alive whether it is animated as we know it. Minerals, metals, and substances are all living parts of a great planetary biology. Everything that is in the planet is necessary to the planet. And But as parents are willing to sacrifice something of themselves for their children, so the planet will sustain and support a great variety <coughs> of labors and opportunities, but not waste. We must stop wasting the resources of our earth. We must use our magnetic fields and those things which are available to us <coughs> for the greatest good of the greatest number. Unless we do this, we are going to find ourselves in a serious problem. We know also that contamination goes down into the ground. We know that there is, there is an inner vital core that the planet is alive. This planet is just as much alive as we are, maybe more so. It has various systems. It has its arterial system, its nervous system, its bony structure. Just as any living thing has, this planet has an entire living integration within itself. 
It is served and noted by three stripes or streaks of life energy. From below upward comes the energy that maintains growth. All plants and things of this nature are nourished from an energy radiating from the core. And then this energy rises through the major stems and roots of these planets, of these plants. The animal or emotional body is sustained by horizontal bands circling the earth. The, therefore, these bands nourish animals and birds largely through the horizontal spine or through some horizontal part of the structure which accepts the energy from the earth itself. For these creatures and plants are all nourished by one earth, by one substance, by one life. Then when it comes to the human being, it's a little different. The human being is nourished primarily from the higher ozonic attitude areas of the earth's surface, the great magnetic fields that extend outward, providing us with oxygen, providing us with life-giving energies, and protecting us from too great power of the sun. Now we learn from uh, fine, fine, from uh, scientific statements recently made that the atmosphere of the outer earth, that part which protects us against the rays of other planets or against the solar energy, this is thinning. Little by little we are losing the protection which nature provides. And we are losing it because we have wasted it, because we have contaminated it because we have paid no attention to what we've shot out there into space. We could experiment forever with an atomic bomb and keep on putting on nuclear weapons and there'd be a big flash and we think that's the end of it. This is where we're terribly wrong. We are gradually killing the air that we have to live with. We are gradually losing the protections which nature set up and which are there until man destroys them. So all this has to be taken into further consideration. The energy primarily necessary for the energy of man comes from the circumference of the magnetic field and comes from the circumference downward to the center. Therefore, man has been called by the Greeks an inverted plant because his root is in heaven and his body upon the earth. But the root of the, of the vegetable is in the ground, the root of man is in space. But they are all rooted in life, and they are all rooted in law, and they are all rooted in common sense. And they all have responsibilities to keep the rules by which they were created. The human being is, mo is the most fortunate, most fortunately placed of all creatures that we know. He was appointed as a gardener in this particular planetary environment. It is therefore not only up to him to protect his own environment, but the environment of all other things. He has responsibilities to protect vegetation, the entire animal kingdom, and the various locked-in spiritual entities which we call minerals. All these things are part of our responsibility. We use them as we please, we destroy them when we want to, and care nothing for what happens. This means a new way of life has got to be created in which we are recognizing the fact that we are stewards. We are not here to run the world, rule it, or own it. We are here to serve it in the name of that power which alone has the right to proclaim its ultimate ownership, and that is heaven itself. If we can continue to do the right thing, we will find that our, our energies will be protected. Today we are very despondent. We are negative, we are half sick, we are tired, we are worried, and we are concerned. Furthermore, the air we breathe is not what it ought to be. The water that we drink is not what it ought to be. The food that we eat is contaminated. All around, we, in the name of profit, we are killing ourselves. And this will keep on until we realize that actually, while we cannot die, we can do a certain amount of repentance. We can also suffer from our own mistakes, even though these mistakes cannot destroy us as living things, because the life is not in the material world, but in something beyond, which physical things cannot reach, but which physical things can hurt and damage and injure and cause sorrow and sadness. 
As we look around in the world as it is today, we see a great influx of new hope. For hope is in the bottom of the barrel, and always has been. We see hope for all the future. A new light is beginning to shine. A new hope is beginning to develop within us. The individual who has suffered much is beginning to realize that something can be done about it. The corruptions of nations no longer pass unnoticed. The various debilities which afflict us now challenge us. Groups are forming all over the world to help to correct the common causes of trouble. We are working desperately to find an answer to all militant uh, warfare. We are trying desperately to find cures for poverty, for sickness, for ignorance, for narcotics, and for all the other ills that flesh is heir to. We caused them, now we have to find the cure. But the cures are coming, and hope springs eternal, and our hope is well founded, for there is scarcely a day goes by that we do not hear of some new effort to do it better. We are every one of us working as best we can to try and see that some of these things work out in our time, and then so and lay the foundations for others that have to work out in greater time. We know that we can do things, and in the next ten years I think we will see the greatest upsurge of integrity that the world has known for thousands of years. We are beginning to have one new emotion that is helpful if in itself dangerous, fear. We are beginning to fear for the future. We are beginning to fear that this future will come while we are still alive. That is not a future that we must now put off for our children's children. It is a future that can hurt us right now, next year and the year after, and in the memory of the past and in the hope of the future. We are now beginning to recognize that cooperation is the life of survival and competition the eternal cause of death and destruction. As this gradually grows in us, we will find the work of peace will spread. That religion will have new impetus and new values with which to work, to, to develop. That religion itself will take on the realization that the, to keep the laws of nature is to obey the commandments of God. The, and the Ten Commandments have to do with morality. The Ten Principles of Conservation natural resources, and the protection of the earth itself from the vices of tyranny. These things are coming now more and more into focus. The wars of religions are going to come to an end because we can only defend these wars by making new mistakes. We cannot destroy another faith without killing part of the world we belong to. And to destroy anyone's belief there's a deep wound in the surface of the planet. All these things have to be handled in a different and better way. And we have to help uh, in every way that we can to restore the garden as it was meant to be, where there is enough for all, and minds freed from the competition and tyranny of ambition can settle down to the study of realities, the advancement of inner life, the strengthening and purifying of the purposes of, uh, of existence. We can each release more of the inside instead of, instead of trying to crowd everything on the outside. In this new way of life, the secret poet can come out and be known. The painter, the musician with real music in his soul can be heard again. Great books can be written again. Great adventures can be undertaken. Great studies of the inner values of life. The study of the extrasensory perception bands the development of the knowledge of man's internal power to cooperate with the divine plan and the way of finding within himself conscious verification of the dreams and hopes that have become so necessary to our survival. We can find in this pressure, pressure of things not an avenging God, but a kindly parent who must be a little more strict and must bring about the things that we all need whether we want them or not. And if that, if we fail to do that, or the parent fails, we would ultimately, as the untrained children, accuse the parent of failure. We will never be able to accuse nature of failure, however, because nature will never fail to teach the lesson 
until the lesson is learned. And then it becomes part of the great resource of understanding and insight which helps to bring us all closer to the divine power which we all desire inwardly and spiritually to serve. This can be the beginning of our first conscious dedication to those rules and laws which will lead to life rather than to death. Thank you very much.